Thank you very much. Are there any public comments regarding closed session items? Yes, you have one public comment. And the public comment is from Ms. Sonia Redona. And the letter she submitted states the following. Um, number one, business department does not interact with parents or students. Number two, no running water. Number three, what about no more than 10 persons in one place? Number four, we are in stage one. It's a stay at home order. We have been working remotely from home since March. We go once or twice to the office to pick up mail, etc. The business department has been getting work, their work on time. We took our equipment to work at home. Now we have to carry the equipment back and forth. Teachers were given options to work at home or school. How about classified staff? End of the comment. Thank you very much. So now we'll convene into closed session.
Nothing to report. Closed session. Okay, public hearing, interfund borrowing. So for the... Do we, need to do we need to open it up? So we open the public hearing. Are there any comments from the public? Be none, we'll close the public hearing. And that's it for that. Okay, H, comments from the public? No. Be none, we'll move to item to the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda items. Okay. Motion by Castillo, seconded by Kiki. All in favor say aye. 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 Aye, unanimous, thank you. Up. Okay, now we'll go to information items. Superintendent's report. And good evening, trustees, just loading this up here. Good evening, trustees. At our last uh, regular board meeting on Thursday, June 25th, we presented uh, to the board the reopening plan that we were working on regarding the different areas. Uh, that presentation took a little bit over an hour, if you remember. And then we talked about the core committee, we talked about the subcommittees, and everything that we were uh, working on. Uh, specifically, some of the areas that uh, we were working on were, are the health and safety committee, uh, as we'll turn to it here, uh, which uh, are leads in that particular uh, committee are Dr. Uh, Thurman, uh, Mr. Dennis Price, and Ms. Esther Martinez. And then for the facilities and operations, uh, we have uh, taking the lead Mr. Cesar Vega and Mr. Gilbert Venegas. And then for mental health and well-being and communication, taking that lead, we have uh, Ms. Brisa Huerta Price and uh, Ms. Hortensia Armendariz. And then the other uh, subcommittee, uh, in under teaching and learning, we have uh, Ms. Elisa Ramirez, uh, Mr. James Taylor, Ms. Christine Colunga, and uh, Mr. Lucio Padilla in that particular committee. So I, I just want to give credit and uh, acknowledge that there's been a tremendous amount of work that has uh, been put into creating a plan uh, for Calexico Unified School District. And I want to thank a lot of the participants because a lot of them put in their own time. They volunteered during the summer uh, to put this together. And I also really want to thank our parents uh, for really participating in the surveys that we put out. And they were wonderful regarding questions that they had and all those questions were taken into account. Uh, and uh, they were discussed in the different uh, committees. Um, so we now have a Calexico Unified School District uh, opening plan and it is about 113 pages long. Uh, it is a fluid plan and it is a plan that uh, will change. And the reason I say it will change is because based on guidance that we receive from the California Department of Education, uh, the California Public Health Department, uh, the Imperial County um, Office of Education, our local health department, uh, as we work with our uh, local uh, unions, you know, the, the plan naturally could change. Uh, and as we all are aware, you know, things are still changing at a national level, at a state level, at a local level. So as those changes come up, uh, then the plan will change. So it is flexible and it is fluid and it will change based on the guidance that we receive. Um, so we want to give you a, a brief, uh, you know, uh, kind of presentation in regards to highlights of those four particular areas. And um, we, we did have a very uh, in-depth in uh, presentation to our leadership team and it took about six hours uh, to to present uh, again because in this plan there's also multiple links as well 
Uh, we're going to give you the highlights, like I mentioned, uh, and uh, we'll start off with uh, health and safety, and uh, we'll have Dr. Thurman uh, come up and give a, a quick uh, presentation on the health and safety portion. You can go to the microphone. Uh, oh. yeah. Thank you. Uh, just go to the very next one real quick. We're going to come back to that. So we looked at this already and what did that mean? This was a, a checklist, some of the um, guidance protocols and, and safety opening of schools. Um, that was um, a while back before we had more detailed information. So what we did here was work with Keenan, our broker, and they have a partnership with the um, Forensic Analysis Consulting Service who handle environmental um, types of impacts to organizations. Um, so they're professionals in handling these types of things. So they have helped a lot of organizations build their plans around COVID protection. So um, really getting firsthand quality information. So now let's go back up. Um, what they've done, this group um, has offered um, the template that they use for creating these plans for free. They will also consult on it when we have it done. Like right before students come back, they'll give us their input. And then they'll also come out and do an analysis um, just for free through, through Keenan to tell us. They'll look at how it's running. They'll analyze it and they'll give us feedback. Here's a weak area. Here's something you need to consider, those kind of things. So I really like that aspect of this and the evaluation piece to help inform us on how safe we're keeping people. So um, I want to go through some of the things first with screening. Um, we are, uh, right now we're doing manual screenings like I did with all of you. Um, I have been going in the mornings, except this morning when I got a flat tire. I <laughs> let Mr. Gonzalez know, I think he did mm -hmm. those for me, thank you. So um, we're doing that right now um, at the sites as well. We're gonna actually have the, a health tech here tomorrow to do those for us. But we have um, screeners coming. We have the, uh, a screener coming that is a, a device, an apparatus that, um, that the, uh, Employees and students will walk through eventually, and it gives a beep that, that goes off. Mr. Vega and I met with the county yesterday, the day before, I think, to um, just look at what some of the things that they're exploring. They had mentioned that the devices they looked at like that were had a three temperature degree variance, which is a lot when you're looking at 100.4 being the time where you have to send someone home. But um, ours is not. Ours is a 0.54, the one that we're getting. So that's within reason. Um, they also said they couldn't be in really hot weather, the ones that they had looked at. Ours can be up to 113 degrees. So we feel confident that the screeners we're having will be coming. We also have an app that people will be using to um, check off what symptoms they've had or haven't had. You know, they've, if they've had any of the symptoms, and that list has grown since we started, right, on taste and, and all those kinds of things, loss of taste and smell. So it lists everything the CDC recommends. They'll check off, um, no, 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 no. If they get a yes, it will say stay home. Um, and uh, that will go to the school district, to the office. It will go to the principal so they know on a Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock if a teacher checks their symptoms and they're, they're out. It will alert the principal, it will go to the office so they know a sub needs to be taken care of for that. So screening is, is um, being handled. We had a picture, we had to think, um, you know, large groups ultimately, most efficient yet most um, the safest possible um, plan to get people in to, and really be secure about what we're doing there. Um, prevention, we know what now we're hearing and learning more every day about what where vulnerable places are in organizations, um, high traffic areas. So we have an inspection form that if you'll click on um, the Appendix G um, up there. Oh, shoot. Where did G go? The G's not up there. Sorry. Well, G is an inspection form that just lists. Uh, it's got probably 15 areas. I, I apologize for that. I had changed that a little bit, and I didn't get the latest one into the shared folder. But um, it's just a principal's monthly thing. I'm going to ask them to do that every month, and I'm going to give them a schedule on dates that it will be due. And it's just going to allow them to go through the areas like the lounge. We're going to have reduced seating, and they're going to check. Is it still like that? Is it still you know, limited seating? Are the rooms still being cleaned the way they're supposed to be? So talking to custodians, and there will be some checkoffs. And then they'll send that to HR. We'll look at that. We'll see where maybe that's not every it's not like a race to see who gets them all correct. If they have some areas that aren't right, then we have to address that. But we want to have something that consciously they're, it's being inspected and looked at um, at least every month. So on the prevention side, those are some things that will help that. Um, part of prevention is the right supplies. So that's under Appendix C. 
Um, and we've got some of the list here. What we don't have here are the specific cleaning supplies, but site supervisors, principals will not be in charge of the actual chemicals that are going to be out there. That'll be m and But on here, you'll see things like um, the no-touch thermometers. Sites will still have to have that when kids aren't able to go through the thermometer, I mean the, the apparatus. Um, masks uh, for everybody. Face shields, which are becoming more popular last couple days. Gowns, eye protection. All the things are listed in one place where principals don't have to say, yeah, I didn't know where I could go to order this or whatever they can click off what they need they can send a copy over to me to mno we'll make sure they get it we've got signs ordered that are coming they're not here right now but if any of those you know deteriorate or break down or whatever we're spending a little bit more to get some that uh, are self-adhesive without taking paint off not the ones you just put up with tape that you've seen around so that it'll be a little more permanent so that's the place to go for the critical supplies um reporting is going to be a big piece if you can go to appendix h Go back, um, Appendix H is um, basically step-by-step step on what happens if we have someone who's exposed or someone who's positive. So if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see um, there's links regarding supporting all the, the actions. Uh, but if you get to the incident information, go up a little bit more, please. Up, oh, I mean, uh, yeah, there you go, <laughs> thank you. So it's gonna say who the person is filling out the form, which area we're talking about, who's the subject of the issue, and there's two boxes there. Are they reporting positive or are they um, just having symptoms? And then it gives a list, keep going down below, of the things that are responsible. And ultimately that is for them to identify right away who exposure people are as best they can and to have that check off and then that comes to HR. And then we have steps that we go through. They're all outlined here that we have to contact the people that are exposed and, and follow up with all those pieces. It's um, very clearly spelled out. Um, like I said, the forensic um, uh, analytics um, organization helped us identify these things. So on the um, reporting, that's going to be a very key, key piece. And uh, you'll see um, one of the ones I like here is the um, Number four says evaluate the level of concern among employees regarding the incident and consider further communications as appropriate. So if you remember for, for us, our first two cases were right when school ended. And we felt like because it was so close, we really needed to get the word out and just let people know. Um, in that communication, we said if you've been ex if you were exposed in any way, we've already contacted you. I think we I called 18 people um, to let them know that they had been exposed and what they had to do. Uh, there were still people that were scared from the communication, like, oh my gosh, if they were at this school and I was there and I think there's a problem. And we said, no, 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 we've already talked to everybody, um, almost everybody. <laughs> we we did have some challenges within that because one of our people couldn't couldn't speak. And so we have to address that. They were already in intensive care very quickly. And so we, we identified through pictures and videos, but what we found out within a day or two is that there were people in that office during the day that we didn't, we didn't know about. So that's still something that we'll work out with the, the county public health because their recommendation was not to give the name and the location and all those things. Yet it led to us having some people who were in those particular offices on their computers, those things that just weren't on their calendar, they weren't a way, wasn't a way for us to know. So that's a, a, a something that we still have to address. But I appreciate that the, you know, it's, it's not saying just communicate everything. Uh, County Health Department said there were some schools even and, and other organizations that did give enough information that people could figure out and it was really ugly for those families, unfortunately. And that was early on, so maybe that level of concern is a little bit different. But, um, and then there's training. If you go to um, Appendix F, um, there are some uh, videos here that we've, um, oops, that's, oh, is the link bad? Did you click F? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a really old one. Um, Appendix S F has 10, yeah, try H. Let's see. Oh, we already went to H. Um, F has 10 videos that are mostly from Keenan, but others are from CDC and things that four of the 10 are required. There's one on hand washing for 20 seconds, one on putting PPE on correctly, one on taking it off correctly, and then there's one on um, just overall um, COVID awareness. And it goes through all the OSHA required information that we're supposed to have regarding COVID. And then uh, let's see, there's the COVID awareness, PPE on and off, um, and then the hand washing. But there are six other ones on, on just the stress that, that this whole thing causes on families that it puts on you in the workplace um, lots of things there that that um, people will have options of, of being able to view but there's some that we're asking everyone to have so that kind of summarizes the health and safety the overall message to everybody is that we get you're scared we understand we want to honor that and have
have you tell us what you're scared about and what you're thinking so we can answer the question. And But if you may have something, I'm not claiming to be an expert in this at all. I haven't been through a pandemic, but if it's a question I don't know the answer to, I will find out. I can call the county health department. We've talked to Jeanette Angulo um, numerous times and we can get the answer. So that's where we're at right now and, and we just want everyone to be safe. I've been emphasizing, you know, we don't know where it's going to go now, way worse or a lot better, but it, in any case, we have to assume that we're, we're all been exposed, and so we have to stay protected. So, questions about that or anything you may have heard? Dr. Turner, yeah. quick question, um, or anybody. So, as part of the health plan, um, as staff begin returning to their work site or to the classroom, is there, will that be part of their uh, I don't know, orientation or training as they return yes we're sending these out before they actually walk in so they understand there's going to be temperatures taken there's going to we haven't sent anything out talking about the apparatus yet you know um, but we have explained what's going to be happening we've get the principals have been doing it I sent them a little training video on what they how they do this uh, how they protect themselves because people coming in you know we, we won't we don't know what, what they'll where they'll be um, exactly health wise so um, yeah they get sent the videos Yvonne uh, kind of because a lot of videos are through Keenan she has to put some password stuff in so that they're available and they watch those as they um, come in so and the Keenan safe schools program um, tracks that so that we know and especially when we're getting in full time but even this kind of soft opening if you will you know with people coming back um, principals have been sending that in and and uh, we haven't had any many questions from them yet or anything but they're pretty thorough videos they are there's a lot of hand washing videos and if you get a chance um, I can let you see these there the hand washing was fascinating I mean I definitely washed for 20 seconds after seeing it where I didn't before I just washed rinsed and off I went so there's some some good pieces thank you any thank other you. questions all right Thank you, Dr. Thurman. And now we'll have uh, Mr. Vega uh, present on the facilities and operations. Just give a quick, uh, quick highlights on that one. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, good evening, members of the board. For the record, my name is Cesar Vega, Assistant Superintendent of Business, and uh, I have the honor and privilege of putting together a reopening plan for uh, three key departments that we. Um, that are going to be necessary as we transition back into uh, reopening our schools. The first one, Mr. Gonzalez, can you go to the next slide, is transportation. So transportation is a little bit unique. Uh, think of a bus as an, an extension of a classroom. Uh, the difference is that you know a classroom is static, remains in one place. The bus is moving throughout the morning or afternoon routes. So our plan focused on the, on the consistency of, you know, what do we do at bus stops? How do we make sure that kids, before they get on the bus, you know, how do we make sure that they are screened um, for temperature? Um, and what happens if someone has a temperature? What, what's going to be the reaction? What's going to be the plan? How are we going to take care of those kiddos? Because as you know, we're not in the business of denying transportation if there is transportation needed for a child. So we talked about that. We went over a process, best case scenario, what is it that we can do? So we first had to identify okay, what kind of a loading zones or what kind of a bus stops do, do we have in place right now? Uh, luckily enough, we provide two types, of, two types of transportation, regular ed and special needs. So when it comes to special needs uh, in the mornings, there is already a, an adult or someone that is caring for a child, you know, walking him up to or her up to the bus. So in the event that that child has a symptom or is pre-screened for temperature, and if there is a positive or a temperature reading that, it, that exceeds, you know, the, the normal, then that child in the morning at least will have, you know, will be there with a, with a parent or a, care, a, a caretaker. So, you know, at that point we can safely say, you know, we cannot transport you because, you know, you, you know the reading comes abnormal. So in the morning, at least from a special ed perspective, we, you know, the child will be, you know, asked to re remain at home. And uh, if not, if the temperature clears and everything, then the child will be, you know, allowed on the bus. Um, we are gonna be required children to wear face masks. I mean, that's gonna be one requirement uh, before they get on the bus. Um, if, it, if there's a medical condition that for whatever reason the child cannot have a, a face mask or a face shield, then obviously we have to work with our special department and c come up with a plan that, you know, that can, uh, can alleviate that. So it, this plan has to be flexible and it has to be tailored to the needs of special needs uh, children. 
When it comes to regular regular education children, uh, we normally pick them up at school loading zones in the morning. School loading zones in the morning are, you know, by design, safe loading zones because that's where the bus is adequately parked and can safely load or unload children. Uh, the difference in the morning is that we are going to be relying on the assistance of special uh, student supervision assistance in the morning to get there a little bit earlier. Uh, as early as 6, 6.30 in the morning, we're going to have to work with their schedules. And, 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 and the reason for that is because, as you know, bus routes start early and we start picking up children early. So in the event that is that, that we have a child that is at the loading zone uh, and at the time that we screen that child, that child has a temperature, uh, more than likely there will not be a parent or, or there will not be a, a caretaker. So at that point, we want someone to be there to care for the child until either the school opens or if the school is already open, even though it may not be the school that he or she attends, you know, there will be someone there to assist the child, the child um, and, you know, we can call the parents or the school can assist us, you know, caring for the child so that the route can continue. If the child clears for temperature, then at that point, obviously, he or she has to wear a face mask. And what we are also looking at is creating seating charts. Uh, obviously, we are going to be required, every bus is going to have to be required to only carry, you know, depending on the capacity, X number of seats, you know, have to become available. Uh, that's going to create a problem because, you know, uh, in the past, every child that gets overflown from one side to the other, we no normally use the capacity of the bus to be able to meet the needs of the transportation or the needs of transporting so many kids. But in this case, it's going to create you know, a, an issue of that we may have to go back several times throughout the morning to pick up, you know, groups of students uh, to keep the capacity of what it needs to be. So we, every bus is going to be equipped with a seating chart and, you know, we just have to adhere to it. So in essence, you know, aside from having a disinfecting plant in the morning or after each route, you know, that's, that's going to have to be in place. Uh, in, in a nutshell, that's what you're looking at when it comes to transportation. We have to look at, you know, special ed and regular ed transportation needs and how to best work around that. Any questions on transportation? No, okay. Thank you. Can we go to the next one, Mr. Gonzalez? So, obviously, uh, my work and uh, Mr. Thurman's, Dr. Thurman's uh, presentation kind of co-relate to each other because, you know, we have to work on, you know, on the facilities you know, from not only, you know, putting policies and procedures in place uh, for reopening, we also have to have the proper PPE equipment, the proper, you know, sanitation equipment that we need to have. Obviously, we have invested in face masks, face shields, uh, hand sanitizers, and all the protective equipment that custodians will need. Now, uh, we have put together a plan where, you know, if, if you know, schools are going to be not only clean, but also sanitized day on a daily basis, we are going to be heavily relying on our custodians to help us. But also, you know, with everyone's going to be given, you know, the Lysol that they need so that, you know, every classroom that has a sink, normally has water, uh, has been already, um, we have installed uh, soap dispensers. So those classrooms already have the flexibility and they're fully operational, fully installed, we're ready to go. Uh, all those more uh, portable classrooms that do not have a sink, they have uh, hand sanitizers, uh, dispensers. Those are, have already been installed, the chemicals are already there. And, uh, but again, we are gonna be heavily relying on our custodians to, you know, they have the product, they know how to mix it, they know how to create it. Uh, so, you know, they are gonna be the ones responsible to making sure that, you know, the, those dispensers, whether it's soap or uh, the chemical, the hand sanitizer, you know, that they are refilled daily. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, having the proper equipment and it's about uh, checking temperatures in the morning. Like uh, Dr. Thurman said, we have purchased a safe check uh, thermometer, TSA lookalike, you know, thermometers. Um, they are gonna be installed. We are waiting for them. We, hopefully we get them this week. Once we get them, we're gonna at, at least keep two to each side with the exception of the high school is gonna get four. But every side will have, you know, the flexibility of having two so that they can have two key points of entry so, you know, so that, you know, things can expedite uh, sooner in the mornings uh, when kids are getting there. Um, those uh, thermometers, infrared ther thermometers can read up to 70 readings per minute. So as you know, when you have multiple kids coming, you're going through the machine, it's going to be able to give you that flexibility of having, you know, that level of reading so fast. And uh, it's also going to is going to avoid having a person doing the screening themselves or him or herself. So 
that's pretty much in a nutshell that's what's in what's in place we are following the cdc guidelines everything that we do comes from it uh, we also train our employees, you know, on the importance of wearing the face mask and it has to cover, you know, from the nose all the way down to the mouth. And, you know, so we have, you know, we have a, done a lot of work uh, training our staff, our administrators. We are, you know, obviously, like, like Dr. Thurman said, we're about to start training our, you know, teachers and our classified. So, you know, it's work in progress as we, as, you know, time goes on. It's a, it's a moving document that's going to be, you know, changed, modified. But, you know, it's a good start, and we're, we're ready to go when it comes to, you know, our custodial and disinfecting of schools. Any questions? All Thank right. You. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, can you go to the next slide? So when it comes to food services, uh, the main area of focus here is right off the get-go in a virtual learning environment, we are going to start kind of having the same pick-up-and-go, you know, uh, uh, food distribution in the mornings. Uh, every day we will be issuing uh, meals, uh, lunch, uh, breakfast and lunch in the morning, and possibly, possibly even supper in the morning. Uh, every morning we're going to be issuing those uh, meals to uh, students that attend that particular school. The difference now is that we are not just going to be handing out food to everyone. It's going to be now only to those kids that go to that particular school. And we are going to know that because every student is going to get an ID a card that will have the school's logo so the child as you know if if a parent or, or if a child cannot physically go to that site to pick up the meal as long as the parent or the caretaker has the card that you know those meals will be distributed so that's initially that's how we're going to start because we're 100 percent virtually uh, once we start coming back to a hybrid model then that's when we are going to start uh, obviously creating the social distance spaces in the cafeteria uh, as we progress into a 50% or 75%, obviously we're going to have to use outdoor facilities too. So, you know, we have already, lo we're looking at, you know, getting more shade structures because again, the need, even though, you know, I'm anticipating if, if we start going into a, hi a hybrid model at some point, more than likely it's going to be in the fall or early part of 2021. Uh, if that's the case, you know, that time of the year tends to be a little cold. So it's, it's more adequate for outdoor, um, you know, um, being around being out and about so but anyways we're preparing for every case scenario so we have a virtual learning program that kicks right off the get-go uh, then a 25 percent hybrid model a 50 percent 50 50 and 75 25 and obviously when we go back to 100 percent then business as usual but in a nutshell uh board we are ready to go as we are we as we are as ready as we can be and again this is a moving plan that has to be modified as we go any questions, concerns? Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vega. Then on the mental health and well-being and communications, uh, Ms. Uh, Brisa Huerta Price will give us uh, some highlights. Hello. I'm smelling the mask. <laughs> this is the one thing I don't like about the mask. You can't see it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I love that this is my turn to um, present because um, if you can, who's doing the slides? Up right, right here. I have Next slide. <laughs> Next one. Um, so I was lucky enough to be kind of he heading along with uh, Mr. Gonzalez, the task force for mental health, social emotional learning, communication, which was a large task. And I was really excited because a lot of the work that we've done, I've done in after school has been around social emotional learning. So this was amazing. And a lot of the people, everybody actually on the task force was really passionate about the subject. So it was just meetings with like-minded people about something that we really like and we want to see more of in the district. One of the things that we discussed was there's always been a need for social emotional learning and uh, teaching skills about the five competencies and what they are and how to implement and how to practice them. But because there's always been you know, other things and other priorities, we haven't been as committed or as intentional as we would like in this area. And um, so we kind of approach this with where are we as a district? What are the needs of our community in terms of our students and our staff? And then how do we move forward without overwhelming everybody? Um, which is part of mental health. And so it was really um, very good conversations. Next slide, please. So we talked we had a lot of conversations about very different top very various topics um next slide please 
And what we came down to were really four areas that we looked at. Next slide. Um, so really looking um, at professional development, maintaining relationships, communication, community engagement, and then resources, providing these to our community and our stakeholders. Next slide. So I like going now because I think Dr. Thurman and Mr. Vega really set the stage and they really address the physiological and the safety needs. So we taught, they talked about, you know, how to keep our staff and our students safe physically and, um, you know, addressing the water, the food, um, how to keep our students cool and uh, in our facilities um, to address the physiological needs. And now we're building up and social emotional learning is about setting that love and belonging and esteem and making sure that our students and our staff feel like they belong so that they then want to connect and be part of our district and our school and our classrooms. Next slide, please. So we realized there was a real need for professional development in various areas. Um, and in my experience, as you learn, then you start implementing with yourself. So a lot of it is starting with the adults in the district. And so as district administrators, as principals, taking care of our teachers and our staff at the site so that they then can take care of our students and the families. Next slide. Big piece with distance learning is making sure that we have that caregiver support and training. So we know that we have families that want to connect and want their kids to do well in school, but they may not have um, the language, technology knowledge. You know, there are a lot of barriers out there. So this, this really needs to um, we need to address the needs of the adults and making sure they know and they feel supported because if the the adults feel well the students will feel better they won't feel the stress that the adults are feeling um, so it'll be a big part of our mental health plan and, and social emotional learning to address the needs of the adults and the caregivers and these can be parents they can be you know the grandparents or the babysitters, the neighbors, the friends, whoever is making sure that the kids are connecting to um, distance learning. Next slide, please. A lot of our conversations were about these relationships, really looking at the relationships, um, you know, within our staff, staff to staff, uh, our students to staff, um, student to student, student to family, home to school. There are just a lot of um, overlapping relationships there that we really really need to address and what it came down to was if you forward through the slides and there's about six um, what it came down to it doesn't matter what the relationships are staff to staff student to staff we really as a district and at the school site and in the classrooms we really need to provide um, opportunities for our, our, our the people to connect create a sense of community um, you know, a lot of community engagement um, and just feel like they belong and embed that those, those activities in everything they do. So it's uh, social emotional learning embedded instruction, not just a separate curriculum to be addressed from this time to this time on this day. So there's, it has to be integrated with what you do, but it also, we, we know that we have to teach these skills explicitly. The other thing is providing training and support for our teachers, for our principals, for our district administrators, for our parents as well. Um, the next one is also, we need to establish some boundaries and expectations. Distance learning has been, and just working from home, has been extremely stressful. And I think part of it is we don't, we, we don't set, and I can speak for myself, we haven't set those clear boundaries. And so I know at home it's, working till six seven o'clock at night the little kids come in and say hey mommy i'm hungry it's like oh that's right it's seven o'clock um you know so creating these boundaries because then we can say you know what i need to stop i need to take care of myself and i need to take care of my family and so self-care here is is huge and again reminding the adults to take care of themselves so that they can take care of the students as well Something else that came up was um, establishing the methods for communication. Um, 
whether it's um, you know their phone, remind, email, putting it out there, saying this is a way as a school that we're going to communicate. Here's the you know the link, the phone number, the email address. Please get us. You know, this is how how we're going to respond to you, because sometimes there's miscommunication and. Um, parents say, but I've been emailing you. It's like, oh, well, that email is not working anymore. We use the phone or we use Remind or we use social media or whatever the issue is. So really making sure that we establish and then we announce to everybody what method we're going to be communicating so that you can get to me and I can get to you. And the other one is clear and consistent messaging. And it doesn't matter, I think, what our relationship is. If I know that you're being clear, transparent, providing the information, and uh, like Dr. Thurman said earlier, if I don't know the answer, let me go find it and I'll get back to you. It's better than trying to make something up and coming across as disingenuous or like you're lying or making it up. So I think it's really important to be clear, be consistent, um, share as much information as we can, and then make sure that everybody w in the district and at the sites is also sharing that same message. Um, that is going to really build relationships. And if something happens, there's a negative experience, then parents are more willing to, um, you know, assume positive intent. It was really a mistake. The better our relationships with our community, our parents, our teacher are, then if something bad happens, they're more willing to listen and work it out as opposed to going and, you know, complaining or, t you know, sharing on social media, venting out. Um, and the last part was self-care. Again, qu can't stress this enough and it comes out in everything we do. And the other thing is making sure that we don't just say that it's important for, for you to take care of you, that now as administrators, as teachers, then we're also following through. So if I tell you, take the weekend off, I'm not going to email you Saturday morning with a question that's going to keep you thinking about um, what your, you know, whatever topic it is. Um, so important of relationships, communication, and also providing resources. The, the issue with the resources is right now, if you go to Twitter, if you go to any social media, if you go to the website, anywhere there is just an overwhelming amount of resources so making sure that we make them easily accessible to our community members so our um, several of our team members they created their own website for staff in the community and if you click on the link um, they just made an easy one-stop shop of community agencies nonprofits of um, you know where parents can go for help whether it's uh, food assistance, housing assistance, um, you know, social services, um, even the district, um, you know, district emails, uh, school phone numbers, um, just all the resources. And then so that you would know some of us and what we look like and putting pictures as much as we can. So that's still a work in progress. The other thing they did, if you look at the community resources, the next um, link they also made that into a pdf so easily accessible the links are live so you can connect directly to them um, if you scroll down a little bit on the left hand side they also um, highlighted the counselor psychologist the clinical social workers and district staff that is available for assistance um, to the people in the district and whenever you know if they had a, a google site if they had a um, a web page, anything. They added the, res the links here so that, again, easy to get a hold of people. Um, we included some resources for social emotional support, and then those are broken down. Um, if you scroll over on the left side, all the way down, those are broken down for students, staff, parents, and caregivers. And then if you look at the site, it was you know, preschool, elementary, by different grade levels. Again, all of the resources that are on here are free. And um, there's a disclaimer at the bottom. We don't, we're not promoting anybody, but they are here. And again, they're broken down. And then there are some mental health supports 
as well, um, social emotional learning for staff and their caregivers. So this is an area where I think we, there's a lot of work to be done, but if we just went out and got new curriculum and uh, a lot of training, it will overwhelm everybody, which defeats the whole purpose of social emotional learning. So really we're going to be looking at our principles for um, kind of like a trainer of trainers. They know their staffs better and then they, can, they know how much or maybe how little to really push it and who's ready to move on to the next step. Um, so we'll be creating some social emotional action teams at the sites and then through them composed of the uh, principal, the counselor, the academic support teacher, um, and then teachers as well and other staff at the sites, there will be this social emotional learning action team and can help guide the work forward at the sites. Um, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what are plans. Thank you. Great job. Any Thank questions? You. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Brisa Price. And um, for the teaching and learning component, to give uh, highlights, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Elisa Ramirez. So good evening. I will start on slide 40. You can take me to slide 40. You got it. So the, the teaching and learning is probably the, the largest chunk of this presentation. So I'm gonna go quickly through some slides. I won't take you through all. Um, so on slide 40, this is where we start uh, informing our stakeholders about what SB90 is and what are some of the requirements. And so if you go to slide 42, please. So the first thing we're gonna discuss is making sure that all of our students have uh, access to connectivity and devices. And so we do have a plan to move our district into the direction of one-to-one. -one. And including we're working with our border league project to add more antennas and uh, more nodes in order for us to have more capacity and more bandwidth. Slide 43. Uh, another requirement is that what we do with our instruction has to be content aligned and it has to be quality and intellectually challenged. So no remediation, no, um, no enrichment activities. It has to be tied to your content and it has to be rigorous. Slide 44. We also have to be able to provide supports for our pupils who are below grade level. So we are looking at programs like iReady for students to do some remediation during after hours, so not during the instructional time. We're also looking at having our ACES uh, supervisors do one-to-one -one tutoring, and ACES supervisors do not have to be servicing only students who are in ACES, but we can actually service all groups of students, and we can even pair them up one-to-one -one with our foster population, our SPED population, our homeless population, so we can design the tiers that we want for our students. We're also looking at uh, uh, purchasing a program where our students have access to 24 hours of tutoring seven days a week to support parents and students during the evening hours um, or early in the morning um, because a lot of our parents do work and so they do have, we'll be able to have that support especially for our little ones. So those are some of the uh, supports that we're putting in place. In addition to our regular tutoring that we're holding, we also have our uh, um, AmeriCorps and our AVID tutors that are also, will also be supporting. Slide 44. And so you just heard um, uh, Brisa talk about other supports that do not have to be necessarily academic. So it could be uh, social emotional uh, support, okay? Uh, s s slide 45 talks about SPED services. So we still have to abide by our IEPs or our individual education program plans. And so our SPED director, uh, Mr. Dennis Price has been working with his team to ensure that students get quality uh, education based on their IEPs. Next. Uh, we are required to uh, provide designated and integrated instruction um, in, in English language development. So uh, we, we do have our uh, academic support teachers that are receiving a trainer of trainers um, during this week so that they're able to support our staff uh, throughout the year. In addition, we still have our, in, uh, our ELITS, which is our intervention uh, teachers at the elementary, to continue doing tier two and tier three intervention for our students. Slide 47. A big piece the, of the requirements in SBA 98 is that we have daily live interaction. So teachers have to provide 
daily live interaction. They also have to do some progress monitoring and they need to make sure that we ma maintain school connected connectedness. And so this is the social emotional learning that we say it, it happens every day. It's not a class. It's, it's, it's just a way of doing things moving forward through this distant learning. Okay, then I'm gonna go to slide 50 and then 51. The meals we already discussed. So the learning continuity plan that I'm gonna present during my presentations on LCAP updates and the SB 98 are very uh, detailed in how we need to take attendance. Attendance is no longer going to be taken the regular way where a student signs in, mark him uh, present, and that's it. Now we have to have monitoring logs where teachers have to monitor the live interaction attendance plus the online interaction. So the teachers are the ones who, who will be reporting the attendance, um, and instead of being present or absent, it's now going to have a new, new codes that was, will say student was engaged online and was engaged offline. Um, and we're creating logs and working with uh, our business department and what will be some of the requirements from our auditors, but teachers will have to work on logs now. Um, and perhaps instead of taking attendance early in the morning, you're gonna take attendance at the end of the day so that teachers can monitor if students were participating. Um, we're also looking and asking questions to the auditors if teachers at the end of the week can go back and make some changes. So for example, let's say that uh, I checked uh, Juanito today and Juanito, by the time the teacher logged off at 310, Juanito hadn't done his online work. But then I go back the following day or up to Friday and I noticed that he did do it, but because he was taking care of his siblings or for whatever reasons, he did it at five, six, seven, or 8 p.m. Then the teacher can go back and give him credit for having completed the task even after hours. Okay, so that's part of the attendance accountability. Um, we will have interventions for if a student is not engaged within two days, um, where we will be having personal contacts, uh, communicating with the parents. So we'll do all kinds of interventions before we even take that person or family to the start process. So we're trying to be more proactive instead of being reactive. Next slide, 51. So this is the part where it says that we need to document. Um, if the auditors come and say, okay, show me a teacher's log for this day for this teacher that shows that the teacher did monitor and did check off that the, that the child was engaged, um, we will have to be able to present, th present that. So we will have to have a system uh, of the schools or the principals having a way of managing those logs. So we're trying to come up with some system. Um, our program that we use for attendance synergy is currently working on some enhancements that will not take place until October. And within those, they're going to be able to create like a, a logging system. So for now, we're doing something temporary until that system is up and running. And so we'll be able to do a, an easy transition from a paper format into the Synergy system. Okay, so now we're going to slide 57. Oh, did I miss instruction minutes? Mm. I missed slide. 40 maybe? Wait, I forgot. Can you go up where it says instructional minutes? It's, it's the one that was green, that one. Um, another one of the requirements is that during distance learning or through or during hybrid, when we start bringing the 25% or 50% of our students, we must abide by the minimum required minutes. So EDCO says that if you have kindergartners, they have to be in school at least 180 minutes on a minimum day. For first to third is 230, and from fourth grade all the way to 12th grade is 240. The only one that's different that is, was not here is continuation. Continuation follows 180. Um, we usually have ours for about 220 because we have a more comprehensive program. But we have to abide by this. And the teachers are the ones that are responsible for telling us how much their work that they're assigning has a value. So we call it time value. So I, the teacher, is, um, I'm the one who's gonna say, I'm gonna give 30 minutes of online life-to-life uh, -life interaction with them, and then the other 210 minutes will be asynchronous learning, for example. Okay, so the teachers are the ones who are responsible for providing the time value of the assignments that they provide. Homework cannot count as instructional minutes. So if I ask the student, for homework, I want you to read 30 minutes, whichever book you want. That's homework. That doesn't count for instructional minutes. But if, as a, as a group, I say, okay, guys, we're gonna read this article, I want you to read it, and when we come back tomorrow, we're gonna have a Socratic seminar on our reading, or we're gonna annotate. 
then that does count as instructional minutes because it's part of a, what it would be like classwork. So there's a difference between what's classwork done online and homework individually. So we need to make sure to distinguish between the two. So if you go to uh, slide 57. So these are our proposed phases. First phase is distance learning, which is wh what we're starting with. And then we have phase two, which is the 25% hybrid model. Then you have phase three, 50% model, and phase four, where we have full return. One thing that uh, SB 98 has made very clear is that a parent has the choice to continue with distance learning even after we go into phase two or phase three. So as a parent, if I don't, I'm not comfortable sending my child when 25% of the students are returning, I can request to be in distance learning the entire time. And we don't have to investigate, they don't have to justify, they just have to say, I wanna continue. Um, and this happens through the hybrid models. Um, I'm not too sure if it's gonna happen once we do a normal full return, I don't believe so. so that is an option that parents have. So that's the part that's going to be a little bit harder for our schools and trying to see how many actually return because perhaps our survey said that 60% of our parents were not comfortable sending their students to school when we did the survey a couple of months ago. But from here to maybe, let's say we go to a 25% mono model in October, that might change. Parents might now want to bring their child over and not do distance learning. So we'll, be con we'll continue to survey our, our parents as we move along so that we're able to uh, adjust our master schedules. Um, I'm gonna take you all the way to slide 61. There's a lot of information there that we did with our teams. So one of the things that we're working with our, our um, labor union is uh, having uniformity. And so we will be using or propose we're proposing these three learning management systems that we will provide trainings to our teachers. Um, and with these learning management systems, you're able to track when st the, the time that students are online. And programs like Canvas and Google Classroom can actually transfer the work that is being done in Canvas, like I put a grade in Canvas, it'll transfer to Synergy, which is our SIS program. So for seven through 12, uh, we're looking at Canvas, which is a program that's highly used at the college level. For third through six, Google Classroom, um, and we supplement with Seesaw, and then for pre-kinder uh, pre through second, we have Seesaw. This doesn't mean that our teachers can't continue to use like Google Classroom embedded in Canvas, so they can still do that, but Canvas is a unified learning management system that we're gonna use to track um, student participation. Any questions up to now? No. Okay. Let's go to slide 80, mm, no, slide 61. So in terms of professional development and curriculum planning, um, distance learning is a very, very different way of teaching. Remember I just mentioned that our instructional minutes cannot be, instead of using our full instructional minutes, we now have to abide by the minimum. So my content area, that's this for a year, now has to be adjusted. So. We have professional development for our teachers on the learning management system that we just mentioned on August 18 and 19. So those are the two days that we're gonna be training them. Next, uh, slide 63, that one, okay. So this is how it's gonna look like. Um, on the 18th, we're gonna do a lot of learning management system and then just a, a, a small section on a program called Flipgrid. Um, the following day, we continue with learning management systems and then in the afternoon, we're gonna give our staff choices on two other sessions that could involve any of these and others that we could uh, continue to add. We're still working with our, with our plan. So Lisa, yes. So the two days of PD will be all be done virtually, is that correct? Correct, wow. mm -hmm. and we will continue to do trainings for staff in the afternoons after you see the schedule, how it looks, the one that we're proposing, you're gonna see how we can do continuous PD even as we go along this, this process. Page 60, uh, slide 65. So we've uh, sent our staff to trainings. It, it was optional because it was during their vacations, but we had some, well, several uh, staff attend our social emotional trainings, um, our synchronous and our asynchronous training. And we will continue to offer our teachers an opportunity to attend any training related to the learning management system that they have to use, uh, their uh, social emotional learning, designated and integrated ELD, 
Um, we still have to continue where our CSI and ATSI, which is how we ranked based on our performance in the CAS test. So that's still a requirement. And then universal design for learning is something new that, uh, well not new, but it, it's been pushed through the MTSS process. So we'll be doing some of that. And we do have some math teachers going to some of those trainings. Uh, slide 66. So in order for our teachers to have time to adjust the curriculum plan, uh, curricular guides, we gave all of our teachers 30 hours um, and we're recommending that three of those days is for working with the curriculum and two of those days is working on assessments because our assessments also have to change. And teachers have until the end of the month to complete these hours. Then we go to 68. So part of, of having them do the hours, we just didn't say here, you go on your own and, and you do your work. We actually have uh, several slides that we use to train our, our administrators for them to then in return teach their, their, uh, their teachers, but we have to look at learning acceleration. We're not going to stop and say for the next two weeks, I'm going to review the times tables in the algebra class because I think that you guys need to remediate in timetables. You can't do that because that's two valuable weeks of of lost on remediation. Instead, our focus is going to be grade level standards. So I'm gonna teach you algebra, but while I'm teaching you, for example, equations or any other topic, I'm, gonna, I'm going to embed some of those skills that I know you're lacking because I, by then I would have given a diagnostic test um, to see where they're at. So we really need our teachers to do, have strong instruction, deep engagement, has to be at grade level, um, and the task that they give students has to be attached to the content standards. So this is called learning acceleration, okay? And then in the next slide. So the focus that we told our teachers is you need to focus and pick the most is, uh, essential and high value standards. Uh, as a math teacher, for example, a, a theme like substitution, I could teach four different ways of substituting and it could take me about six or seven days. So instead of that, I'm gonna work more intelligently and use two days and teach one method, but teach it really good for our students to be able to manipulate. So that's the kind of work that we're telling our teachers to do. They are the experts in their con content area, so they, they need to make those decisions. So they need to make sure that they identify those standards and the prerequisite skills to be able to support the students as they're teaching the content level standard. Any questions with the curriculum? Um, planning or professional development. And you have a question regar regarding uh, learning acceleration. Yes. I have some people that I know, they're second, second grade teachers, and some of the students they have can't even read. So how are you going to reach out to those kids? I mean, it's, it's a varied level, mm -hmm. and uh, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So this issue has always happened even pre-COVID. Right. So for example, I've been an algebra teacher for 20 years and I always had to teach fractions, which is a third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade standard at ninth grade. Same with integers. So what you do is as a teacher, you still focus on your standard and as you're teaching the lesson, spend about two minutes reinforcing some of those skills. In terms of the uh, programs that we purchased, um, the program that we purchased recently called iReady is going to diagnose the students. So the student's going to take grade level uh, assessment, which is called diagnostic. Then after I'm done with that, for K through eight, it's, gonna, it's going to give them a, a prescription of lessons that they have to take, and it's all individually paced depending on your needs. So then the students in the afternoons, for example, can log on and do maybe their lesson in fractions, even though in the regular class, they're learning other material or the teacher can align the lessons and says, okay guys, I want all of you doing fractions because today we're gonna do a lesson in fractions and I want you to continue the learning through this program. So th those are the type of programs that we're using so that it will support the skills that some of our students are lacking. Yeah, but you have some of the kids that whose parents don't even, they're, they're totally lost, mm -hmm. second graders, whose parents are not there to support them. Mm -hmm. I mean. So that's, that's the type of work we're doing with that, and that's why we're having our ACES supporting, and that's why we're having our 24-7 uh, tutoring services. Um, we, ha we're, we're, we have a lot of, of tiers to be able to support our students. Um, one of the things that we also know that even before we bring the 25%, um, when we're ready to start returning some students, 
we can start with bringing some of those students first before we move into 25%. So for example, uh, the second grade teacher can identify the second grade students that are really falling behind and maybe instead of calling at random the 25% uh, the of the students, they can say, you know what, let me work a week before with these eight students and every day they're gonna be coming in and we're gonna work in small groups, separated, and I will provide t uh, um, targeted intervention. So we can do that once we were able to bring a, a few more students uh, onto our campuses. Yeah, but even when, they're, when you were live, you were not giving an intervention. Mm -hmm. These kids were lost in the system because there was not enough help for the teachers. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you work with that? Yeah, and, and this is a, a, a state level uh, issues, um, and you see it more in mathematics. I mean, we're not having the TAs anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we used to have a lot of TAs that would help mm -hmm. out the teachers. But now these kids are lost in the system, and it's 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 a waste. Mm -hmm. So and it's hard on the it's not fair to the teachers. No, either. it's not fair to the teachers, and and also it's not fair on our parents. Um, we do have, which is not the norm. We have ninety two percent of our students that are unduplicated pupils. So these are your English learners, which who struggle, your foster students who struggle, and your um, at risk students, low socioeconomic uh, disadvantaged students. So Calexico does have huge challenges yes, um, you do. compared to other other districts that maybe they only have 30 per 30% of the population is the same population that we have at 90%. So we do have a, a hard, hard um, job in front of us. Um, and so we do plan and we have had a lot of interventions um, and we'll continue I mean, to work hard to try and, and get some of our, of our students back on track. And we'll continue um, <clears throat> to make sure that we provide that support, Michelle Romero. I mm -hmm. think we're probably one of the only districts, I'm going to say, that have the English language intervention teachers, and that's specifically for the purpose of pulling out students and mm -hmm. providing that intervention because our EL population, I think, is at about 66, 67%. Yeah, 66 district-wide. Uh, district that is the highest than any other district in the county. So those are the type of services, and this board has been very supportive mm -hmm. with that in regards to the LCAP to bringing that type of support. Yeah. Uh, so with the intervention programs like iReady that uh, uh, Ms. Ramirez is mentioning, which is going to really target the gaps that the students have, that's powerful. Because once you have the gaps, then you can establish you know, that instruction that uh, our students so desperately need. So We're also working with parents. We have all types of, of uh, trainings for our parents. And our, the focus the last year in how to help your, your students, it's not that the, we don't expect the parents to know the curriculum. And there's no way that we can teach our parents a content that takes years. But we're teaching them strategies um, and educating them that their children have resources. They have a book, they take notes. So how do you use those in the home? Because the students don't know how to use them, neither do the parents. So we're teaching them, ask these questions. Can you show me the book that you're using? Okay, can you show me what page you were on? Can you show me your notes? Can you look at your notes and see what, where it matches to your book? So those are the kind of guiding questions that we're teaching our parents because there is no way that they're gonna know the content, but they can guide the students uh, how to uh, provide structure because some of them have the resources, they just don't know how to use it. Unfortunately, some of these parents just are not involved, okay? Mm -hmm. Correct. Question. So I know there's an opportunity to bring students back in small numbers, right? Would that require a waiver? And would the board have to approve that? Mm, no. What we do is we work with our um, local health department. We provide right. them the plan. Mm -hmm. So for right now, um, we just got an email that, that our Dr. Monday will work with us because he, he will allow us to bring, for example, for our SPED population that has to be evaluated, we need to present a plan and say, this is how we're going to test, this is the precautions we're taking, this is how far the tables are going to be, we're gonna have a, a, one of those plastic barriers in front. And so then he approves the plan and he says, okay, you're good to go and one student at a time. So we can do those, but we need to get approval from, uh, or recommendations and approval from our local health department. Okay. And, and that's something that like, uh, Ms. Ramirez mentioned that we are waiting on from the county uh, health department, from Dr. Monday specifically. Um, we have been discussing that in the superintendent's meeting in regards mm -hmm. to 
some of those that are most in need, you know, specifically our special ed students and IEPs and testing and um, even one-to-one, -one, you know, is that something that the, the county uh, will support us in? And of course, there has to be a plan, like Ms. Mm -hmm. Ramita said, uh, but that is direction that is gonna be put out by the county health department. Okay. The waiver is more if you wanna bring bigger amount of students. So there is a waiver process right now, it was delayed because their, I guess their database went down. But six, the, yeah. the waiver application is that, let's say I say I wanna bring all my kindergartners, right. then I have to go through the waiver. Okay, another question, uh, it might be coming up next. Um, so learning loss, I mean, I'm kind of interested in hearing that as you collect your data. You know, what was the loss of instruction, of content, you know, from our students over the last, you know, in the last school year? Obviously instruction, learning wasn't the same. Um, we most likely see a decrease in, in you know, content and retention uh, over the summer. So I know as you're doing some of the assessments, I think that's gonna be your next slide. Um, I'm, I think I'd be curious, or maybe you can come back to the board with information. Uh, how are students comparing at the beginning of the school year, uh, maybe to previous year where they left off? Uh, you're talking about interventions um, and the tools and you know the resources that we'll provide to you know regain some of that time lost. I ready ELA and math. Mm -hmm. You know uh, those are some questions I had later on in the, in the agenda item. So it appears that we're purchasing an account for almost every child, almost every site, mm -hmm. correct? So on that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I used it maybe six, seven years ago. It was six, seven years old at that time, right? So this will be web-based. One of my questions and concerns is it does take a lot of time. And my question was, what, is the, what would the plan be? I don't know if you have one yet or can share it later. I did hear you mention that it would be done after hours. The students could use it on their own time. Mm -hmm. That is very, it's interactive, it's computer-based, engaging. Mm -hmm. That might, I know I can see that as a resource, a tool for the younger kids who are tech savvy, you know, who can jump on it quickly, easily, and go through their ELA and math, because it's fun, game-based, you know. Um, but I'd be interested in, you know, at a later time, come back with a plan. From my experience, it took several minutes a week Mm -hmm. um, dedicated to it if you want to get the true assessments the true data collection um, you know it could be a period maybe even you know I don't know it was 40 minutes a week or mm -hmm. 80 minutes when classes come back you know how would that fit into their schedule or would mm -hmm. it continue to be done after hours mm -hmm. so later you know maybe you can share a plan yeah and when the state refers to learning loss it's specific to mathematics language arts and ELD and so I ready will be for math and ELA. Um, the diagnostic test is for TK all the way to 12th grade. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's across. Um, by learning loss, what they want us to do is we want you to diagnose your students now so that the teachers have the skills that the students are lacking. From K through eight, um, they, they can still continue using I ready with the individualized plan that it gives depending on how you performed. For the upper grades, it'll give the teachers in math and ELA the skills that their students are lacking so that when they're teaching their, their content standards, they need to make sure that they understand what the students are lacking. Then you give the test again in two months, three months, well, end of the quarter, end of the trimester, and that that's, that's where you're gonna see how much was gained of that learning loss. So it's not to diagnose and see how much they lost from the previous because we don't have a base for the previous. It's, it's the, the first test and then the next test and then we can look at the data and see how much was the growth. Are we still mm -hmm. doing star? No, we're, we're right now we're, we're, there's schools are using all kinds of programs. So what we told them is right now we want them to uh, hold on to temporarily postpone everything that, that they're doing because we don't want to overwhelm our parents and our students and we want to focus with one tool that as a district we can use and the one tool that we're using is iReady. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I can talk to you later. More okay. About that, but just Elisa, and, and, and real quick, just to piggyback off what Richard said and a little bit what Michael said, make sure that we identify these kids because like Richard said, there are parents that don't understand this whole thing and we don't want to lose those kids mm -hmm. that don't understand it. Make sure that they get that extra whatever resources are E either through ACES, Sparks, whatever, refer them over to it. That way they know what they're doing because sometimes when a kid is not engaged, they just lose it and that's it, they, they lose interest. Mm -hmm. And that way they could get that, you know. Yeah. And, and that's one of those things I think that might hit on a little bit and something that Richard was kind of uh, hinting on also as well. 
you know, just to make sure that we follow up with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's a big thing. We, we don't want to lose them. Uh, right now, for sure, the, the, the plan that we have for our ACES is that we're going to pair them up with our foster students and our homeless students. Um, that's the very first thing we're going to do. Um, and then from there, we have to educate our teachers on what are some of the resources that we'll have available so that they can then reach out to their administrator and say, okay, th th I, this student is participating, but he's very lost. What kind of intervention can we give? Or these students are, are not participating. They're not even here. They're absent. So we have another plan for that because the law says that after three days of no participation, we have to intervene. Our plan is to start intervening after two days of no participation. Okay, so that's why the, the teacher's logs are so important. Page 84. So let me ch show you what a uh, schedule would look like. All these slides were for teachers and preparing them for curriculum planning. So we have the, this template for our kinders um, and our first through third and our fourth through six because they all have instructional minutes. But this is what we're proposing. What we're proposing, and it says proposing because we're still negotiating uh, the schedule, but what we're proposing, this is a, a sample of an elementary. What we're proposing is that Monday through Thursday, in the morning is the teacher's prep, but they can still you know, communicate with families. It's their prep time. Um, but at 8.15, um, the teachers are going to do live interaction, and you have from 8.15 to 2.15, you have two hours to go over three of your uh, content areas. So in this case, I put ELA, social science, and ELD. That's an example, okay? Because they can, it can, they can be flexible. And what we're, we're recommending is that out of these three courses, uh, you can divide your presentations in six minutes of live interaction with your students. And then the other 60 minutes can be done with online work, which we call asynchronous, or uh, projects, tasks, okay? Then they have a break. Then the, from 10.30 to 12.20, same thing. You cover the other three courses, and you have to do at least 60 minutes of live interaction throughout the, the, that, that time. And the other 50 minutes can be asynchronous work. Then after that, you see you have the lunch hour. And af once we hit the lunch hour, we met the, the minimum required minutes. After lunch, from Monday through Thursday, teachers will have virtual hours. Teachers will, have, will make one-to-one -one connection with students and families. Um, they will review student work and ensure that they are doing their online work. And then they have to monitor their progress. And see at the very bottom, it says engagement participation monitoring log. That's when they have to go in and double check uh, the engagement and see if they were uh, attending or not. Um, and during those times, they can still continue to do some instructional planning. Then on Friday, what we're proposing is it's a, a full day of prep, and this is what most districts are doing. Uh, but what we have is we're giving teachers the prep in the morning so that they can do more planning, assign their uh, online work or project that students have to do. But because every day they have to have live interaction, um, we're proposing that from 9 to 10, they have an advisory period. And during that advisory period, you will be connecting with your students. You will be going over some of the things that they're struggling with. Um, you may do an SEL lesson. You may teach your students how to structure their, their day if there's, they can manage the, the, their day. So there, there will be a lot of connections between you and those students. At the elementary, it's your own students. Secondary will be different. Then after that, students will be working online or on projects. And the teachers can work with their grade level teams to continue planning. They can work on their learning management system. They can continue to monitor the participation log because by the end of the week, we wanna make sure that they've gone back and they reviewed all of their students and make sure that they participated. And then in the afternoons, we're proposing we do professional development. So this is what we're going, going to offer, more trainings on SEL, more trainings on the learning management system, so we embedded a PD time on that Friday. So teachers still see students, students still get online work, but there's a lot of opportunity for professional development and ac academic outreach. So this is what the first through third grade would look like. So let me show you what the secondary would look like. So page 90. So see, the, this is, they're all similar. So in page 90, this is what the 
high school or junior high school look like? Aurora is a little bit different because they have five periods. Same format, same picture, uh, different setting because now you have six teachers and you can't compete for students. So what we're proposing is we gave every class 40 minutes. Um, so I, the math teacher, have period one. My social science teacher has the, my kiddos in period two and so forth. So we're proposing 30 minutes, for example, of synchronous live interaction. And 10 will be what you need, but we're saying make sure you do more than 10. I mean, for example, more than 20 because the minimum is just what the law is saying. So just to be safe, just do a little bit more of the minutes. So at the end, teachers will be done by 1215. And then after that, it's exactly the same as the elementary. They have office hours. They have one-to-one -one contacts. Students are still working on asynchronous work. So students are not off the hook at 12 Students have their lunch period and then they can continue after lunch working on their online work. Students are going to end the day at the regular time. So if kinder is out at 145, that's when students should be done with their asynchronous work. If the first through third are out at 1220, then that's how long they go. You see the 310 because this is a teacher schedule. The teacher has to work until 310. But children's schedules will differ depending on their grade and their, the bell system that teachers have. So then this will transition smoothly to the phase two and phase three. On Fridays, one of the things that we talked about is I can't say to my math teachers, hey guys, I'll see you in period two because those students in period two could have science or ELA. So we agreed, um, unofficially, still not in the MOU, but verbally we've agreed that we'll make period two an advisory period. So I will see my period two students and I'm going to be their anchor. I'm gonna be their support during this time for SEL lessons, for helping them how to structure their day, um, how to organize, um, any kind of support that my, my student might need. So I might have SEL lessons on this. And then maybe the ELA teacher will have some of my period math teachers, but she will be the anchor for those students in period two. So everybody in period two will have one teacher that they report to every Friday for support. And then the rest is exactly the same as the elementary. Page 103. So I'm gonna show you what we are proposing for phase, uh, phase two. Oh, one, 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 oh that's fine, you can, you can, that right. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you're fine. So for the 25 model, 25% model, notice it's the same pattern, same exact thing. The only thing that we're emphasizing here is that you're gonna see on Mondays, group A. On Tuesdays, group B. Then C and then D. And those students that are not coming um, on, on Mondays, so my groups B, C, and D on Mondays will be doing distance learning. Um, but I still have to have some type of live interaction with them because I have to have daily live interaction. So what we're proposing is a teacher can do a live stream lesson where they're, they're teaching their class and they're being live streaming their lessons for the rest of the students. That's one option. The other option is what we call the flip model. I'm gonna give you the lesson, maybe I'll record my lesson, and those of you who are not here, you're watching the lesson um, at home, but then I'm gonna bring you back in 10 minutes and say, okay guys, any questions uh, that I can answer right now? You saw the lesson recorded, but now I can interact with you. And during those 10 minutes, the students that I have in my class are working online, and I'll be connecting with those that are not. So I'll be doing two tasks. Or a 50% model, which is I will teach you here in front of me half of my minutes. And then when I'm done teaching the lesson with you, you're gonna go online. And while you're online, I'm going to do a, a virtual lesson with my other 75% of my students. So the teacher does the lesson twice. So those are three options that we're proposing so that we still address those that are doing distance learning. And page 109. And page 109 is the 50% model. So it's exactly the same thing. Everything's the same. They're the same recommendation, same minutes. But now we're grouping students into AC. I'll see them Monday and Wednesday. And BD, I see them Tuesday and Thursday. But on Friday, I still have the same format. I still have my anchor period two. I still have the PD. I still have to monitor the engagement logs. So it's very fluent, it, it just transitions and it doesn't make uh, any conflict. So that, if on this day, uh, let's say we come on Monday, 
And Monday during the day, we find out that more than 24, 25% of our schools uh, had a, a surge of cases. Then all I have to do is tell my students, hey guys, school is closing, I'll see you tomorrow, distance learning. We're following the schedule from distance learning. And it's the same exact schedule, except that we're transitioning back to distance learning. So that was one of the requirements, that when we do our schedules, they're fluent, easy transition, and in case we have to go back to, to our homes, it, it just continues. We don't have a, a lapse in between. So that's how we proposed and we created these schedules. And that is it. Those are my presentations. Thank you, excellent report. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Ramirez and, and sorry for Mr. Vega and uh, Ms. Huerta Price and of course, Dr. Thurman. So these are just um, kind of trying to give you a, a, an update, trustees, in regards to the plan. It's, it's very comprehensive. There's a tremendous amount of work that's gone you know, into them and just a very thankful for, for the team for, for putting it together. Um, a lot of communication mm -hmm. taking place, uh, you know, we. Uh, consistently put out newsletters to our community. Um, we did a cafecito with the superintendent, which uh, had a lot of uh, parents attend, teachers attend, and it was uh, uh, it was excellent because it gave us an opportunity to talk about you know the plan, uh, and that's where we had a, a lot of questions as well that we could feel from from the community. And I know that the press has also put out some good articles regarding you know, our reopening in regards to our distance learning plans. And so that gets the information out to, to the community. Um, so next steps, obviously, our sites are incredibly busy. Uh, I think I shared, it took us about six hours to go through this plan with uh, all of our administrators and set the expectation and advise them exactly where we are at and where we're going. Um, uh, and so they're already putting out, working very hard to uh, put out their now information with their <coughs> with their staff, <coughs> with their parents, and uh, distribute materials and equipment and everything that is needed. Of course, we're moving forward with the one one to one devices, and thank you for your support on that. Uh, we have the MacBooks at the high school level, iPads uh, at the seventh through eighth, uh, Chromebooks for all elementary, and we are looking uh, for uh, to have the iPads also for all elementary students uh, as well. Uh, teachers will be allowed back into their classroom starting this Friday. Uh, doc, as Dr. Thurman mentioned, there are trainings that uh, they need to take for specific videos that they'll be uh, viewing. Uh, and our teachers check in uh, officially on the 18th, which, uh, as Ms. Ramirez mentioned, there'll be a lot of trainings that uh, they'll, be, they'll be going through. Um, and on the 20th will be actual teacher check-in day, so if some of them want to physically go into the classrooms again, you know, they can they can do that. That will be optional for them. Uh, a lot of professional development uh, that's happening. Um, as Ms. Ramirez again mentioned, learning management systems, which is going to be a huge component of uh, uh, distance learning. Uh, Social-emotional learning is going to be another huge component of that PD, uh, as Ms. Uh, uh, Huerta Price uh, mentioned in her presentation. Uh, distance learning for best practices, digital citizenship. So, you know, the list goes on in regards to the training that our staff will receive. Uh, our welcome back, uh, we will have one. It will be virtual. Uh, it will be Friday, August the 21st. So we do uh, hope that, uh, well, we expect everybody to, to be joining us. And, of course, trustees, you'll be invited uh, as well. Uh, so we will be sending a, a Zoom link to everyone to make sure that everybody logs into that. Um, and so uh, first day of school is Monday, August the 24th. Everybody is excited, um, you know, very busy trying to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we will be ready, but uh, everybody's working real hard to make sure it's as smooth as it can be. And again, it'll be virtual. And uh, thank you, Ms. Ramirez, for all the wonderful work that the team has done in regards to all the different proposals, putting them out there. So uh, everyone has an idea of the direction that we're going. Uh, and of course, a lot of guidance that we're receiving in regards to a lot of agencies and when uh, uh, when we can, you know, safely go back. But uh, as far as a plan, uh, it is in place, and so we're just uh, uh, moving forward with it. Uh, again, being very flexible, knowing that there will be changes uh, along the way. Uh, so that's our update on on reopening and our plan, trustees. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. V, update.
great things that are happening. Uh, you know, the parking lot is looking great. And uh, I know that the stucco, it's already almost done. So that's taking place. Um, I know that coffee gym, it's also well underway, even though that's not a Metro B update, but still being renovated. So a lot of good things are happening. Um, there was also a news article today, Mr. Gonzalez, that about uh, you know Metro B and what we're planning to do in the future uh, with uh, Metro Q. Uh, but I mean, overall facilities are looking, you know, there's, there's a lot of progress in our facilities. Uh, the Kiki Camarena project, it's also, I mean, looking really nice. So, you know, it's, it's a team effort. Everything that we do in facilities is just not, um, it's, it's not a one-person job. I mean, there's just a lot of minds, a lot of team effort, a lot of meetings, a lot of talking about things, and, and it's just, uh, you know, phenomenal. So, so I, and I saw the uh, ACs are uh, getting put on top of... Yeah. Uh, Correct. Yeah, there's so still some mechanical components that are correct. That, that, that are still missing, but yeah, the, I mean the main units are already up. Yeah, that's what I saw. So I mean, there is a lot of progress that that's been made. So you know, I think we have uh, John. So I'll let John uh, kind of take it over from here. Can you hear us? Go ahead, Mr. Dominguez. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, board members and Superintendent Gonzalez. I'd like to start this, uh, this evening with a, a um, update on the district office bathroom upgrades. Uh, Eduardo, do you want to walk through the, go ahead and walk through the, uh, yeah, the three week look ahead. So as I'm going through the three, three week look ahead, um, Eduardo will be showing you pictures of the demolition, um, demolished bathrooms. Um, the three week, in the next three weeks, we are, um, our submittals for all of the equipment has uh, been completed. Uh, the procurement of the um, equipment, the faucets, the tile, all of that is uh, ongoing. We have our substrate installation. Substrate, you can see right there, that's where the installation is gonna go for the back of board, so to accept the tile. The tile will be um, floor, to, floor to ceiling. Um, we have ADA upgrades at the sinks, ADA upgrades at the soap and towel dispensaries that are um, based on the district's standards. Um, we have tile installation happening, plumbing upgrades where necessary, we have smart pig, or if, for a better term, uh, for the uh, inspection gauge of the pipes uh, in the bathroom to make sure that they were, um, that they were still you know, all good and uh, in good condition. Um, we have the flooring installation happening in the next three weeks, sink and faucet installation, and the urinal and toilet inst installation. Uh, one of the issues that we are running into is the material availability in this project. We changed out the sinks to uh, motion activated faucets, and because of the COVID-19 um, uh, issues, there that's a hot that's a hot item for many uh, public agencies to replace their faucets, and so. We are searching uh, to, ex to, um, to expedite that lead time for the motion activated faucets. Any questions about that project? No. Uh, Kim, you wanna go into Godfrey Gym? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the Godfrey Gym project is continuing every week. Um, there's a three week look ahead and you can see from the pictures, they um, the front entry has been enlarged. I think that's on picture number three. Um, they're getting ready for the rubberized flooring. There you go. Um, it's going to look a lot better. They took a lot of that overhang out, so you're going to have a lot bigger um, opening to get more lighted in there. Um, they've ordered the high impact rubberized athletic flooring. Um, in the next two weeks, they'll be painting the ceiling black. Um, and so that'll hide all that equipment up above. Um, is there any questions for anybody? It's moving right along. No questions. All good there? Okay. Um, the two, uh, classroom addition and circle drive. Um, so the next three weeks, uh, the three look ahead, what we're seeing right now again, we're ongoing with the interior mud, taping and texturing, the painting of the, uh, is, of, the of the interior is ongoing. The stucco finish installation is happening. You see all the, uh, all, the, uh, all the work that's going on there. 
um, with the scaffolding and also the application. There you go with the application of the stucco. Um, once that gets in, once that gets on, then we'll we'll do the base coat and then the finish coats on that. Uh, HVAC ductwork is being installed. The concrete staircase landings and railings are being installed. The interior finishes um, in terms of electrical, plumbing, uh, crossovers, the uh, ceiling grid, all of that is installed. Cabinetry and marker boards. Cabinetry and marker boards, they have arrived, but they cannot be installed until the flooring goes in and the flooring can't be installed until we get the AC operational. So we're anticipating that the AC will be operational during the week of the 24th. Um, we have notified, uh, the contractor notified us of the delay because of COVID um, and the delivery of the installation uh, of the material for, um, for the HVAC unit. Uh, let's see, on Circle Drive, uh, Circle Drive is almost complete. I'd say not Circle Drive is 95%. It looks, it looks amazing. Uh, that picture right there was taken from the rooftop on a day when it was 120 degrees. And uh, you can see the, the uh, striping is all done. Um, one of the questions that the board had was in terms of the, um, was the elevation and the surface runoff. Um, that was addressed uh, in the current design for the future new buildings. Um, as you can see, uh, can you go down to the to this picture, right? Keep going. No, he's in Kiki. More, it's gonna be right, right there. So right when you walk into the admin building, there had been a flooding problem there. And I know that, uh, you know, we talked about that with uh, Chris and also uh, with the architects and when you stand in the position where I am in this picture, and or if you walk up where the where the um, crosswalk is up there, you can see the elevations, and you can see the swale and where that runoff water is going to go. And that the reason it's at that elevation is because it's for future planning. It's for future planning of the um, of the elevation that's going to be required for the uh, admin building. And it's also um, built so it, the water, any runoff water goes into the planter area and dissipates and perks into the subsoil. So they did take in consideration what that was. And once we get the new buildings built, um, it'll be at the same elevation that you see currently if you were standing looking out from the admin building. Let's go to um, Kiki Camarena. Hold on, I have a question. A question? Yes. Uh, you're you're stating that uh, for whatever reason uh, you're gonna leave it like that because of the uh, future construction. There's nothing that says that uh, this this uh, bond is going to pass and that we're going to build something another another admin building in the next couple of years. However, the way that it is right now, uh, if when it rains, it's going to be a mess right there in the administration building. I would think that a multi-million dollar project would have thought about that instead of saying, oh, well, we'll fix it on the next round. Uh, it, it improved the situation there um, from the design that went into the, um, to the new parking lot by directing the water to the planter area. And I think that's what your question, I'm having a hard time hearing the question, but uh, um, if I'm hearing you right, the design allows the water to run off into the planter box area versus where it was going into the corridor area before. No, my point is when it rains, it is going to go into the admin building again. Well, the we're being told differently by the architect. And, and we have a design and I, I, I provided the district a um, engineering design that shows the, the, the runoff and how it's gonna be directed into the planter boxes. 
We'll see. Before, this is a DSA approved design. So obviously when plans are submitted for modifications or additions or new construction at an existing facility, DSAs we use that impact between what's gonna be new versus what's gonna be remaining. So DSA would not have approved a plan that was not, first of all, it's, 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 we have to bring it up to code. Because remember when that building was built, it's many decades ago. So what you see there, it's already taken into account uh, you know, the runoff that eventually, if it happens, if it rains, I mean, it's, I don't think it's gonna eliminate it completely because you have two different facilities, one that is up to standard right now and one that is many decades ago. Uh, but I know that when I talked to the architect too, when, when, when I was discussing that, you know, that, that issue, the planters are there for a reason and that's so that the water can be captured there, and, you know, soak in and, uh, you know, alleviate some of the previous problems that we had. Okay. Kirk. Next slide. Is there any more questions about that project? No. Okay. Kiki Camarena. So the driveway asphalt and concrete curbs are installed. Striping installation to comp was commenced on 811. It's completed. Um, the uh, and the project is is complete. The um, ADA stalls are installed, and uh, the teachers are now allowed to uh, park back on the facility. It looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, J3 ROP committee. That one is uh, that one is Mr. Calderon, uh, but he's not here today. So we'll skip that one. Uh, LCAP committee. So as I mentioned before, the LCAP uh, has been uh, canceled. We no longer have to do the LCAP. Instead, we had to do a COVID-19 operations report, which we did already, and it was a board approved uh, a couple months ago. And now we have the learning continuing attendance plan. The template for this plan just came out uh, last week on August 3rd. Um, a lot of the, the, the learning continuity uh, and attendance plan is different than what SB 98 is and it's different to what the reopening plan is. The reopening plan does not have to be board approved. The learning continuity plan does. And so what we did is a lot of the requirements are in this plan, we already planned for and addressed in our reopening plan. So for example, um, there are questions in this template that we have to respond in terms of what will our instructional offerings look like in person, which is like your 25% model and our 50% model. And what will it look like for distance learning? Um, do students have access to devices and connectivity? Um, are we providing professional development for our, to our staff and our parents? Um, how are we gonna monitor the students that are participating? So all of these questions I've already addressed in the reopening plan. Staff roles and responsibilities. Teachers now have to have, for example, office hours. That's unheard of during a regular school year. So how is that changing? Or will we have to do some shuffling to have some teachers do distance learning while the others are doing the 25 or 50% model? So those are things that might change as we move along. The addressing, addressing learning loss. And what are we gonna do to support our students that are under foster care, our students who are experiencing homelessness, our English learners, our students with exceptional needs. So all that has to go into this plan. Um, also, the, the uh, providing diagnostic tests for our students in ELA, ELD, and mathematics, which we discussed earlier today. And then the, the, a big piece on family outreach. Um, and then finally, our school nutrition. So those are the topics that have to be embedded in this plan. The difference between this and the regular reopening plan is that on this plan, you're gonna have also some actions. Um, like we mentioned, we're gonna be using some of the um, learning mitigation laws to purchase more devices. Well, that has to be in our plan. We have to say what actions we use monies to address these needs. And then the other difference is that we need to have stakeholder input. So once we write this plan, I have to take the plan before it's approved to our DLAC committee, which is our English Learner Parent Committee district-wide, and to our, our advisory committee. And so we have both committees, so we'll take this plan for them to review. 
Then I have to take it to a public hearing for additional input from the community. So that's why we need two uh, board meetings in September. The first one is for the public hearing. And then the second meeting, we're gonna bring it to the board for approval. This has to be completed and done with the plan, the stakeholder input, everything in a month. Um, so the due date is by September 30th. Our board meeting is on September 24th. Then once you approve it, we send it to the county. After that, it doesn't need additional approval. The county will review it. They can provide recommendations. But after that, we're, we're done with this plan. And then we'll look for the LCAP for the following year. So that's my update on the LCAP. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. okay any questions on account payable pre-list? If none, we'll go to board reports. Mr. Castillo. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's hard to believe we're already in August, uh, beginning of a new school year. Obviously, the school year is very different than what we've had in previous years. Um, but, you know, with that said, you know, the amount of work that's been taking place, you know, with the documents that we've been shared with us today, the plans, um, you know, are, are amazing, I think. You know, we, there's a lot of work that goes on behind it. I don't think the board or, you know, many of us see all the things that are going on behind the scenes. But again, I just want to commend, uh, you know, the staff, everyone that's involved um, here at the district, certainly the staff at our sites that are preparing for the start of school. You know, as I drive around town looking at school sites and the facilities, you know, lawns are looking good, preparing, uh, you know, and being maintained. So again, just want to thank and recognize everyone across the district who, who are involved and in getting things ready for a start of a, a, a new and different school year. Uh, with that said, you know, there's a lot of communication happening and I've seen that through Remind, uh, through um, the constant contact, through emails from our school sites. So it's exciting to see things picking up again, you know, as uh, people are reaching out to parents, uh, resources that are available to them. And, and I think I've heard maybe the, the computer and devices being distributed soon. I know that'll be shared with us. Um, you know, a part of that communication was the, the cafecito uh, event that occurred last week. So I had a chance to, to sit in in that session and I think that was very well done. A lot of good parent comments from parents, even the staff popped in and had good questions. Uh, but I, I heard very good feedback on that. You know, facilities as we were talking about, you know, it's amazing to see things happening, you know, here in our town. Uh, you know, many of us had the opportunity to visit the sites, you know, recently. Uh, the high school, uh, parking, the new building, the culinary. I want to mention, you know, uh, Mr. Alvarado, Mr. Uh, Ciro Calderon. You know, I saw that video you guys did uh, with Mr. Ortega. Very nicely done, and I want to just commend you guys in public. It was nice, and there's a lot of good feedback on that. So we're representing our district well. Um, and then um, I think, uh, you know, as we get ready for the new school year, you know, I want to wish everybody the best as we're teachers are starting to return. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mr. Lerano. Well, just like my colleague said, Mike, um, exciting, uh, different, but exciting uh, school year. Just want to welcome everyone back. And like he said, everybody that's involved right now with all these plans that are taking place right now and coming to fruition, now we're actually seeing, you know, the fruits of your, of your guys' labor. Um, facilities are looking great. The high school is looking awesome. Um, I pass by every other day just to see the difference that it looks, um, and, and it just looks amazing. Um, as Mr. Castillo said, I had the opportunity to walk uh, through the new building, which is a facility along with uh, Mr. Calderon and our superintendent, um, also with our facilities manager, and it, everything looks, it looks great. I just can't wait for it to actually be completed. That way we can see uh, how, how it all falls up. Um, comes to play um, with that said um, I just want to thank everyone for um, putting in their part and I also want to welcome everyone back I know it's going to be this next week week and a half is going to be moving pretty quick and uh, for our students mm -hmm. you know just for them to know that we're, we're here for them I think the whole board is here for, here for them and we're here for their safety um, other than that that's pretty much it thank you thank you Mr. Calderon. thank you so just like my colleague said, uh, it's uh, it's already August, so we're ready to go. We just reviewed the plans that uh, that the district office has provided for us. 
for the uh, for the reopening. I shouldn't say reopening for the start of the new school year. Uh, something that we have never faced, at least in my lifetime, and I'm pretty old. So uh, it should be interesting. However, with these plans that, that they just showed us, I, I think uh, we are prepared as much as we can be prepared. Um, hopefully we set an example for the other districts, districts in, the, in the county as to what is it that a district needs to do in order to be prepared in a, in, in a situation like this. Um, like uh, my colleague said, let's be careful out there. Uh, we are in no rush. Uh, and uh, have a good uh, start of the school year. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Gonzalez and your, your entire staff for putting together that reopening plan. That took a lot of work, and I want to thank all of you for the work that you guys did in preparing that report. Uh, it's obvious that things will change as days as we move forward but you know I think we're ready and um, also all the capital projects going on is it's really incredible the high school uh, Kiki Camarena uh, the Family Resource Center um, we're improving our infrastructure and and that's good I want to welcome all the teachers and other classified employees uh, who are the backbone of our district thank you now we'll move to um, K-1. Agreement between Calexico Unified School District and Franklin Covey Klein Sales for the leader and me on site training at Jefferson Elementary. So I'll make a motion to approve the agreement with Franklin Covey for Jefferson. I'll second. Motion by Castillo, second by Alvarado. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-2, agreement between Calexico Unified School District and Frontline Education for Absence and Substitute Management Subscription. I move to approve. I'll second. Move by Calderon, seconded by uh, Alvarado. All in favor say aye. 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 Aye, unanimous, thank you. K-3, agreement renewal between Calexico Unified School District and Asset Works LLC for Inventory Management Services. I'll, s I'll go ahead and move to approve. No, second. Moved by Alvarado, seconded by Castillo. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, unanimous, thank you. K-4, agreement b renewal between Calexico and by school district and document tracking services for license and other services related to the single plan of student achievement for 2021 school year. Carlos, is this a recurring? Yes, it is. It is? Okay. It's ongoing. I'll, I'll move to approve. Second. Moved by Calderon, seconded by Alvarado. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-5, agreement between Calexico Unified by School District and Dermas Floor Covering for Construction Services, small projects for Calexico High School and William Modena Junior High School. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. I'll second. Motion by Castillo, second by Alvarado. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. Agreement between Calexico Unified by School District and Huffington Mifflin Hardcore Publishing Company to pr purchase Huffington Mifflin Hardcore Re 180 Universal Transition Subscription for 2021. Move to approve. Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. Agreement to collect schedule by school district and care docs for the provision and implementation of an electronic health record system for 2021 fiscal year. So moved. Second. If we discuss this quickly, just quickly, um, is quick question. Have we used this before? This is care docs. I believe that this will be the first, first time, year, yes, that we're, we're trying it out, yes, and Who's, it is no cost to the there's district. There's no financial impact, right? Correct. Correct. Who's yeah. using it? Oh, uh, I mean, uh, this will be our health technicians no, with no, our parents. No, uh, other districts are using it. I'm not sure which specifically other districts, but uh, I, I know that. Um, yeah, it seems like a new service. I haven't heard about it, so. I'm right, so we'll we're, we're trying to jump mm -hmm. on and, and see if this is going to be something that uh, will streamline when it comes to our health and our records and more importantly, the communication uh, between health and records and our parents as well. Okay. Um, motion by Alvarado. Yeah. It's to provide iReady as a diagnostic tool for ELA and math for 2021 school year. I'm going to make a motion to provide ready. I'll go ahead and second that. Motion by Castillo, seconded by Alvarado. Some fair say aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. K-9, at least agreement between Calexico Unified School District and the Imperial County Behavioral Health Services 
for housing of the Vista Sands program from July 1st, 2020 to June 30, 2023. I move to approve. I'll second. Moved by Calderon, seconded by Verado. I'll in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-10, service agreement between Calexico Unified School District and the Imperial County Behavioral Health Services for Vista Sands Socialization Services Program from July 1st, 2020 to June 30, 2023. So moved. I'll second. Moved by Verado, seconded by Castillo. I'll in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-11, can contract between Calexico Unified School District and After School Unlimited for pro professional development services for expanded learning for the 2021 school year. I'll go ahead and motion to approve this. M motion by Castillo. I'll go ahead and second. Seconded by Alvarado. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-12, proposal between Calexico Unified School District and CW CWG for monitor specifications for Measure B projects in Godfrey Gyms. Monitor? Yeah, so there's monitors. If you remember when we toured the culinary arts project, there's going to be two large monitors that are going to be placed there. Oh. And then there's going to be additional monitors, all for the purpose of instruction, that are going to be put in the newly remodeled Godfrey Gym as well. Oh, okay. how, how many monitors are going to be in there? <clears throat> Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I can definitely do a follow-up. Okay. That's fine. All right. Okay. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Motion by Calderon, seconded by Alvarado. All those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, aye. thank you. K-13, proposal between Calexico Unified School District and Pixabyte Solutions for video surveillance cameras and installation for the Family Resource Center site. So moved. I'll second with a quick mm. question. And the question maybe just be a request for, this is the video surveillance, I think it's Verkata, is I think what I saw in the agreement, Verkata Systems. I think it would be, maybe if we could in the future at board meeting, just show us a little brief snippet of what this video system looked like, the monitoring, uh, so the board can have an idea of the, the, you know, the benefit of the surveillance system. Just a request for future. And is, is this something that for maybe in the future for uh, the high school also as well and some of the Absolutely. other schools? It's all integrated system. Okay. Correct. Very nice. Yeah. Motion of the Alvarado, second by Castillo. All those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-14, Memorandum of Understanding between Calexico Unified School District and Imperial County Office of Education for College and Career Readiness Initiative for 2021 school year. So, so moved. Second. Motion of Alvarado, seconded by Calderon. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, unanimous, thank you. K-15, Memorandum of Understanding between Calexico Unified School District and the Imperial County Office of Education Support Services Department for Nursing LVN Services 2021 school year. So moved. Second. Motion by Alvarado, second by, by uh, Calderon. Also in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-16, approval of textbook adoption by of My Companion as a core curriculum program for designated ELD for grades 9 to 12 English language learners. So moved. I'll second. Moved by Alvarado, seconded by Castillo. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, unanimous, thank you. K-17, approval of new course language in content grade 11 for Calexico High School for 2021 school year. I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Castillo. I'll second. Seconded by Alvarado, all in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K-18, approval of the new course language and content for newcomers for Calexico High School for the 2021 school year. I move to approve. Second. Motion by Calderon, seconded by Alvarado. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, unanimous, thank you. K-19, approval of the new CTE course plant and soil for Calexico High School for the 2021 school year. Move to approve. I'll second. Question, motion. just a quick question on this. On this particular item and several of them, uh, the following, we're approving a new course, new CTE courses. My question is, are these new, brand new courses uh, on the schedule, on the master schedule, or are we renaming something? So I'll have uh, Ms. Ramirez um, um, give you the update on that, because you're yeah. right, they're all basically I didn't get a chance same. to ask earlier. You know, yeah. so, so, so it's the same, very similar, but we were trying to rename them so that we are in the correct industry. So we're not creating a new course. No, it's not completely new. Okay. 
that mm-hmm. was my concern about impact and master schedule mm-hmm. and all that. And alignment with IVC, are we working on that? Yes, we are. Okay. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, motion by Castillo, second by Varado. Also in favor, say aye. 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 Yeah, I must thank you. K20, approval of a new CTA course, ornamental horticulture for Calexico High School, the 2021 school year. Move so approve. A second. Motion by Calderon, second by Varado. Also in favor, say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K21, approval of new CTA course, agriculture leadership for Calexico High School for the 2021 school year. So moved. I'll second. Motion by Varado, second by Castillo. Also in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, unanimous, thank you. K22, approval of the Agriculture Career Technical Education Incentive Grant for 2021 school year. I'll make a motion to approve the grant. Second. Motion by Castillo, second by Varado. Also in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, aye unanimous, thank you. Approval of the Pinnacle Hall Community Day School Waiver Request of Parts of the California Education Codes and Regulations, Section 48660. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Calderon, second by Varado. Also in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, unanimous, thank you. Destination of CIF representative to leave for the 2021 school year. I move to approve. I'll second. Move by Calderon, second by Alvarado. Also in favor, say aye. 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 Unanimous, aye. thank you. K-25, Application of Categorical Programs for Continuing Funding in Title I, Part A, Title II, Part A, Title III Immigrant, Title III Limited English Proficient, LEP, and Title IV, Part A, for 2021 school year. So moved. I'll second. Moved by Varela, seconded by Castillo. Also in favor, say aye. 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 Aye, unanimous, thank you. Approval of the 2021 45-day budget update. Present. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh eight and it's eight fifty. I move to I I move to uh extend the meeting until ten o'clock. Motion but okay, motion by God I don't think about that at all. Also in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, aye thank you. You have five minutes, Mr. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that'll be the fastest presentation ever. All right, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. I know that I invite Maribel to join me via Zoom, so just in case there are some technicalities that I cannot respond to you right away, she's there to help me. Um, I'll go ahead and start So while she gets logged in. So, again, so, board, um, I just want to start by saying thank you, and I, I do mean it because... Look, you adopted a budget back in June that completely changed. And, and, and to be honest with you, you know, we had no choice but to have an adopted budget. So, so uh, the law allows me to, whenever you have material changes that are significant in nature when it comes to our funding, you know, the law, uh, the law allows me to have a 45-day budget revision to what, I, to what you approved back in June. So this is what it is. This is mainly focusing on the current year, okay? So... Again, back then we were facing a 10% hit, you know, negative 10%. So at the end, we were restored to prior, to, uh, prior year funding levels. And when it comes to the LCFF, what we were expecting, what you adopted, you adopted a re- you know, revenue of $94 million, you know, again, with a 10% cut in funding. Uh, fast forward to now. So now the a 45-day budget revision, now what you're looking at is revenues of $102 million just in LCFF, local, to, local control funding formula. So we are being restored to prior year funding levels, in essence, okay? But yes. So is that included, so that, we went to 102 because of this one thing funding? No, I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that, that's my next slide. Okay. So this is only the local control funding formula. This is state funds, yes. okay? This is our main, our, our main funding. Yes. When it comes to feds, so this is where I want to take a few minutes, uh, Mr. Calderon, because it's important to understand that we have a lot of one-time money that it's been distributed in many different ways, okay? Primarily, what you're looking at is you have the CARES Act, the ESSER funds, and then you have the Learning Loss Mitigation Funding, okay? It's federal money, but it has two, two deadlines, and, and it, it's, you know, it funds different programs, including supplemental concentration uh, students that generate additional funding. Um, and 
the total amount of money that we're that we're getting, it's it's one big time uh, one lump sum of fifteen million dollars. That's what we're gonna get in one time funds. Okay, but again, there are deadlines that we need to know and understand. All right, so this is how it's distributed. Okay, the one time money. So. The big difference again is that we are getting just for this school year, just this school year, we are getting fifty million dollars more in one-time funds. Eleven million dollars of those funds, that's the money that has to be used by December thirty-first of this year, twenty twenty. Okay. What can we use it on? Dis distance learning, anything related to COVID, anything related to the pandemic. PPE, PPE for, equipment, for disinfecting materials, the Lysol. thermometers, the, I mean, anything that's COVID related and anything that supports distance learning. Okay. The other amount that the, the CARES Act, it's also, you know, we're supposed to get that money this year as well. That money, however, has an expiration date of September 30th, 2022. So we have a lot, we have a long way uh, before we have to use the money by. And the reason, the reason, for, I, I don't understand exactly the reason for why until September 30th, 2022, but it gives us flexibility in terms of if we don't need to spend the money now, we can use it next year, which is a plan that I have proposed to our superintendent because when you think about what's gonna happen next year in terms of funding, Next year is going to be really the one year mm -hmm. that we are going to be hit the most due, due to the pandemic. So my recommendation to Superintendent Gonzalez and to the board is allow me to put this money aside into a different resource so that when we need it next year, we have the ability to tap into those resources. Okay? Because we have until September 30th of 2022. You have a question, Mr. Calderon? Well, I just want to make sure that with everything that this district is going through right now, that we don't nickel and dime uh, what we need to buy. Like I just mentioned, Lysol, uh, PPE equipment, uh, resources for our teachers, our clerical staff, m &O. So we need to make sure that we provide everything for everybody to be safe. Right. Uh, so as long as we, as long as you use the money, uh, and our staff is properly equipped, I don't have a problem with you uh, asking the superintendent to put the money aside. I right. just, what I just don't want to hear is that some people, they don't have enough gloves no. or that they don't have enough uh, resources in, or, in order to uh, get the job done. Now, let me ask, let me ask something. This money cannot be used for, to hire new staff. No, it cannot be used okay. for salaries and benefits. Okay. Only exclusively related to COVID-19 okay. related okay. expenditures, okay? So, look, the money will be received this year and it will be placed under a different resource, uh, the $4.2 million, mm -hmm. because that, again, because of the amount of time that we have to spend it. If for whatever reason it's needed this year, it will be there, all right? Um, for planning purposes, that's my recommendation, just to allow us to hold the money until you know, the following fiscal year. So, Mr. we're Vega. getting one-time money again. We're getting $50 million. Yes, sir. Oh, and maybe you're gonna address it. You listed a potential problem on that yes. previous slide, uh, maybe regarding cash flow. You said funding had to be spent by the end of this year, but the money hasn't been received. No. Nope. When would it be received and how does that affect us? Well, we're supposed to receive it, they're telling us before before the end of September. Okay. That's what they're telling us. We haven't received it yet. We are being told that you are going to receive. We are going to receive it. It's just it hasn't come in yet. Um, you know, if we have cash flow issues, we can tap into the money if it's there. Um, right now, the way w the way we are projecting, and although we're not required to provide a cash flow at this particular budget presentation, we are projecting to be cash flow wise with you know the the the, the transpiring that we're planning to do. We should be okay. Um, again, we're waiting for more federal money, if it's ever going to get approved. If it gets approved, then the, the level of uh, ca uh, cash deferrals will be significantly less. So, but that's still pending. We should know more next month when it comes to, you know, where, we're gon where we are going to be in terms of our cash flow. So, again, so because we are receiving this money this year, 
on the revenue side of the house, we have recorded. And that's why you're seeing an increase in funding for this year because it's one time. We also have to create a, an expenditure plan. So we have to have a $50 million uh, worth of expenditures uh, in the expenditure side of the house because, again, some of that money has to be spent. So the $11 million, the one that has to be spent by the end of this year, we can go back to March and start claiming expenses related to that, you know, to COVID so that we can, you know, credit some of the accounts, some of the money that we use to pay for the PPE, to pay for whatever it is that we needed, like the iPads that we invested so heavily on the, on the I think it was back in May when we made the uh, first purchase. So, I mean, we can credit all, you know, that money back because of these one-time funds. So we are working on a plan of, well, we're working on collecting all the things that we have, all the, all the, the records of all the money that we have used for COVID-related expenditures that can be, you know, as, you know, use us, you know, to reclaim, to say, you know, we have already used this money, so, you know, so that we can credit accounts that we have used in the past to pay for, like, the iPads and things like that. So the rest of the money, what it's going to be left is the money that we are planning to use for the border link antennas, for the purchase of the iPads, you know, the, the, the other, the second round of iPads that we're planning to buy, and we're going to try to maximize and use all the money before the due date. I mean, that's the goal. It's going to be 2.8 to $3 million. So, so that's where the money is going to be coming from, from the one-time uh, funding. The one thing about the iPads, I will tell you that we are investing so much money into one-to-one -one technology, which is great. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. Uh, just be mindful that five years from now, mm -hmm. those iPads will become obsolete, mm -hmm. will need to be replaced. So if we're spending six, $7 million this year in all of that, more than likely, five years from now, we're going to need about eight, maybe nine. Depends on the you know price of things. So that's something that you know my recommendation is: as as soon as we can start putting money aside, or if it can be supported through the LCAP, or you know we just have to have a plan in place because at some point that's going to become you know a need. Once you start something, you have to start budgeting and saving money to have a you know replacement program. Okay, so just want to you know throw that in. So, quick question. Yes, sir. The CARES Act, is that coming in six payments? <sighs> Maribel, are you there? Yes. Can, can uh, Mr. Romero is, uh, the question? Is the CARES Act funding coming in six payments? Coming what, I'm sorry? In six payments. Six payments? Yeah. I haven't heard that. I did hear that we might get the uh, CARES Esther, until December. I know we got ours and uh, it's being made in six payments. Wow. Oh, okay. No, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Uh, I am aware that the majority of the money we're receiving in September, but the ESSER uh, is going to be until December, more or less. Okay, thank you. But Maribel, we can do a little bit of research on that. Maybe Mr. Romero has a good point and we don't, that we don't even know. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, revenues, expenditures? Does everybody understand the difference in funding and how we're planning to use it? All right. Everything that I'm giving you in this spreadsheet, by the way, it's at the back end of the package that I gave you. And it, and it also gives you a, a detailed explanation on how each you know, uh, part of the money is being funded. So when it comes to our, you know, projected ending fund balance or, you know, how we were at, bu uh, at adopted budget versus where we are now. Back then, we were facing, you know, a, a deficit of $13 million to the current year. Now, because we are being restored to prior, prior year funding levels, and, and, and again, this is already taking into consideration the one-time money in the revenue side and, and the expenditure side too. What you are really truly looking, we still have a structural deficit for the current year or $4.9 million, $5 million, just under $5 million. That is the structural deficit that we have. Because again, this is ongoing. One-time money, you only get one year. So the structural structural deficit, in spite of us uh, putting a freeze on positions, in spite of, in, you know, in spite of us being you know, uh, tight on our resources, we are still facing a $5 million deficit. So I just want to point that out to the board. Um, so what does that mean in terms of 
uh, reserves. Uh, when you adopted a budget, our reserves for the current year were projected to go all the way down to 7.33%. Uh, now, because of the change in, in budget conditions that the governor approved at the end, now our reserves went up a little bit and we are now looking at a 12.14% uh, reserve for the current year. Uh, this, again, I am, by law, I am allowed to have a 45-day budget revision on the current year. But next month, in about three and a half weeks, I will have to present to you what we call the unedited actuals. By then, you will see the conditions in terms of a multi-year projection on what that impact is going to be. Once we close the books, this is part of the closing the books. So once we finalize and close the books and we present to you the unedited actual report, that's when you will see a clear picture of where we are in terms of our you know, beginning fund balance, ending fund balance, in terms of, you know, what's going to be really our bottom line as we move forward in the current year and in the, in the next two years out. So, again, that report is due on or before September 15th. Our board meeting is, is on September 10th. That's when we will be presenting to you the United Actual Reports. Any questions? I try to be as fast as I can, Mr. Collins. Excellent report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maribel. Good night. You're welcome. Good night. Okay, so therefore, I will to approve that. Sure. Motion okay. by Avarado, seconded by. Second. Cadero, not so fair, CI. Aye. Aye. Unanimous, thank you. No. Uh -huh. K27, resolution for the budget and cash transfers for fiscal year 2021. I'll make a motion to approve this resolution. Motion by Castillo, I'll seconded second. by Varado. Austin Ferris, aye. What's the resolution? I, you, oh, it's a resolution? Mm -hmm. Mr. Castillo? Aye, yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Unanimous, thank you. K28, resolution authorizing contract to procure Apple computer product services and related items pursuant to public contract code section 2118. It's a resolution. Motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Motion by Cadarón, seconded by Alvarado. Mr. Castillo. Yes. Uh, Mr. Alvarado. Yes. Mr. Cadarón. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Unanimous. Thank you. K29, resolution regarding disposition of, of surplus assets, non-assets, school bus at Felipe Vega facilities. So moved. Second. Motion by Alvarado, uh, seconded by Cadarón. Mr. Castillo. Yes. Mr. Oledano. Yes. Mr. Yes. Me, yes. Thank you. Unanimous. Board President Romero and trustees, I apologize. Uh, K30, we're going to be pulling that item from the agenda. Okay. K30. K31, resolution regarding disposition of surplus asset, non asset technology equipment at Cesar Chavez Elementary. So moved. A second. A motion by Varado, seconded by Castillo. Mr. Castillo. Yes. Mr. Varado. Yes. Mr. Varado. Yes. Ah, yes. Unanimous, thank you. K32 Certificate Employment Report. I'd like to make a recommendation that the board approve the certificated report as submitted with the following additions. One, uh, accept the resignation of Jaime Santos as principal of uh, Rockwood Elementary School and also the transfer of uh, Jaime Santos to English teacher at uh, Aurora High School. So moved. Second. Motion by Varado, seconded by Calderon, and also in favor, say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. Classified employment report. To make a recommendation that the board approve the classified employment report as submitted. We'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Castillo, seconded by Varado, and also in favor, say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. Uh, no announcements for closed session. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn, 906. So moved. Motion by Castillo, second by Varado, all in favor say aye. 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 Nemes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.